Yes, let the church say amen again. <laughs> amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, as your words, not my words, Lord. Use me, Lord. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and shape me, Lord. And let us hear what you have to say to us today. In Christ we pray. Amen. 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 We have just went over the first seven verses of the chapel of, da of Daniel. So I gave a name to this sermon called Fight the Power. There was a song not too long ago by a group called Public Enemy that had a popular song called Fight the Power. We're not going to play that song today, but there's some relevance in fighting the power. So from what we've read, where are we? We are in Babylon. At this time, King Nebuchadnezzar has taken over Jerusalem. And they were taken back to Babylon as captives, including a number of four people. And one of them was called Daniel. Now, when you read the first chapter, he had his name changed. And his name was changed to Belteshazzar. And that was the name given to Daniel, and it means Bel protects his life. But Daniel has a special meaning. It means God is my judge. So he got his name changed. Now, when did this happen? Now, this happened around between 605 and 536 BC. So let me ask a question. A little uh, be a teachable moment here. What does BC mean? Before Christ. What does AD mean? Okay. All right, now, I used to think it was after death myself, but, that, but it doesn't add up. Now, we have the English version was said, the year of our Lord. In Latin, it's Anno Domini. That means year of our Lord. So now they use something called CE and BCE. CE is common era, which we live in today, and BCE is before the common era. What splits up BC, I'm sorry, CE and BCE? Jesus Christ. But we use CE and BCE to take out Christ. Anyway. I thought the same thing. I said, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is trying to take Christ out, but your Christ is still the measurement. Good job. Anyway. <laughs> so, these guys had their names changed. So, in the book of Daniel, it still refers to Daniel as Daniel. And Daniel had three other buddies with him. They were Meshach, I'm sorry, I just lost my place here. Forgive me for that one here. Shadrach, Meshach, and who I call a bad Negro. So. So these guys, these were four of the, some of the smartest men in Jerusalem who King Nebuchadnezzar wanted to use for training and other purposes. Something the king did was kind of interesting. What the king used to do is that when he had servants, he would put a ring in their nose, a piercing. And on that piercing was a chain that he had by his side. So when he needed someone to do something for him, he would pull that chain. Now, I don't wear earrings. Some of you ladies have earrings, and you can contest to this. If you had a pair of earrings that were, let's say, $200, $500, and they got snagged on a sweater or whatever, would you just yank your head to pull it out? No, you would, because it hurts. So imagine if someone wants you, you have a nose ring on, and it just pulled the chain like that. You are coming fast. And that's what the king used to do. Now, when the king got together with these men, 
he wanted them to have the very best. He wanted to get them trained. So what he said was, these guys are going to get trained for three years. We're going to give him, give these men the food from the king's table. Here's the problem. The king's table, the food was offered from another god. I want you to picture it this way. You go to somebody's house you just met, and they have this marvelous feast in front of you. Steaks, ribs, chop, whatever you want. It's right in front of you. However, when they bless the food, they bless it to somebody else. Satan, Allah, whatever you want to use. Do you eat the food? With these men, they said they can't do that. They cannot eat the food from a from some, some other table that's been blessed by someone else because they follow the one true God. So they have to stay true to themselves. So how do they fight the power? They fight the power with food. This is how they fight the power. They said, they said, listen to me. We will not eat that food. Just give us lettuce and water. And the uh, guy who, who came to him to say, hey, you got to eat this food, said, look, if you do this, you're not going to be healthy. You're going to be sick. And Daniel said, give us 10 days of this lettuce and water. And in the 10 days, they look healthier than the guys eating the regular food. So see, when you fight the power of God, what happens is God will also strengthen you in ways that no one else can understand. But that is God working. So, these guys were eating this lettuce and water and was healthy. Now, how else do you fight the power? Well, you fight the power of wisdom. And I got to come out here for this demonstration here. A lot of times you go to certain areas and you see these psychics on the wall where they will read your palm and tell you the truth. Well, it worked a little differently back then. And this is kind of how it worked. I got to use somebody as an example here. Ted, you're good. Ted is one of the wise men in the land. Wisest man in Cedar Grove. Wow, only one amen. Not a, it didn't come from your wife at all. She just looked at me. Praise Jesus Christ. Any up, <laughs> amen. amen. This is what would happen in King Nebuchadnezzar's court. He would call the wise men and say, Ted, I had a dream. I need you to interpret that dream. Go ahead. Ted, I think you're kind of stalling for time. So I had a dream. I need you to tell me that dream and interpret that dream. Now, before you answer, let me say this to you also. In those times, if you did not answer correctly and be 100% correct, you were, guess what, 100% dead. Well, it's been good, Val. He gone. This is, in Daniel 2, this is what happens. The king has a dream. He needs his dream interpreted, but he's not going to tell what the dream is. And when you read Daniel 2, he gets angry, and he says, look, your guys are stalling for time. You need to tell me what my dream was, and what my dream means. You look at the psychics today, they'll read your palm and say, you had a tough life, but you'll be rich soon. What? That's all you got? And I remember there was a psychic on TV who got busted by the IRS. They came to the house to arrest her. And I'm saying, if you're a psychic, you know they're coming, why are you, why are you still home? <laughs> I 
seems logical to me if you could tell the future. But that's what they did. This is what they did. Back then, you had to be 100% correct. There was no room for error. But King Nebuchadnezzar, he put something else in there. He says, you're going to tell me my dream. And then you're going to interpret it for me. Well, they couldn't do it. They stalled for time. And King Nebuchadnezzar said, I need to get some new wise people, so I got to get rid of the old ones. Kind of like when you do a spring cleaning, you clean out your closet, and you give it away, and then you buy new stuff. Well, we're going to kill these guys and bring new folks in. Well, when he got to Daniel, Daniel says, wait, just give me a day. Give me some time, and I can figure this out. And he goes to sleep, and God reveals King Nebuchadnezzar's dream and what it means. So when he goes to King Nebuchadnezzar, he explains to him, this is what your dream was, this is what's happening, and here's what's going to happen. Right then and there, he did everything. King Nebuchadnezzar fell down and said, your God must be the true God. He fell right down, fell prostrate on the ground because he told him his dream. This is what your dream means, and this is what will happen in your dream. The whole king kaboot right there. Imagine you had to not only interpret somebody's dream, but you got to tell them what they dreamt. You know how many times you dream in the night? You dream about seven times in the night. But here, here he was able to tell the dream, what the dream meant, and what the dream was going to happen. And if you read Daniel 2, it's a really beautiful story on what happened. Now, when you fight the power, so we fought the power with food. We fought the power with wisdom. And now we have a third power to fight. Remember we talked about the 60 cubit high gold statue where the music played and everyone has to go and worship and fall down? Well, our three brothers, Shadrach, Meshach, and the bad Negro, they said, no, we're not doing that. So the king was kind of upset. And what the king said was done. The king would say off of his head, he got his head cut off. Whatever the king wanted, it was done. So the king came up and said, hey, I heard you guys are not doing that. And they responded to him in a rather interesting way. And they said to him, in, three, in Daniel 3.16, mind you, says, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Let me say that again. We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Can we keep it real for a second? Can I get real for a second? King, talk to the hand. Can we be real, real? Can we be real, real? King, read between the lines. That was death. That was automatic death. By just saying, I don't think you're dead. You either do it or you're dead. So Nebuchadnezzar, let's keep this real here, was pissed. He was upset. But here's what the, God, here's what the, here's what the three said. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. That's why I said, he was a bad Negro. That's, that's, that's some tight stuff there. He says, we will not do it. Tell you what we're going to do. So Nebuchadnezzar was furious at him. He had them tied up. They would be thrown in the furnace. They made the furnace seven times hotter. And when they threw him in, 
even the guys that threw them in burnt up. When they got thrown in, they took a look in the furnace. And they didn't see three men. They saw four. And they said, we see four men, and one of them looks like the Son of God. Newsflash, it was the Son of God. When you are finding the power, you are not fighting alone. And so it goes further in 26, as Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. So the three came out of the fire, and they saw the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was the hair on their head singed. There was no smell of fire on them. And Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro who will send his angels to rescue his servants. When you walk with God, he will clear your path. I want to take you back some years in American history to 1954. That was Brown versus Board of Education. Brown was Olivia Brown from Topeka, Kansas, and they're fighting separation of segregation, excuse me. Well, segregation was started in the 18, almost the 1890s, Plessy versus Ferguson. Well, they get to the Supreme Court and they win. But that wasn't the first win that they had in this case. And it wasn't the second win. It wasn't the fifth win, the tenth win, the twentieth win, or the fortieth win. They won 50 cases in a row to get there. When you are persistent and you are with, with God is on your side, he will make a way. It was not an easy fight. And what you see happening today is something really unique. You have people who are villains yesterday and heroes today. I want to take you back to the 1968 Olympics, Carlos and Smith. These are the guys, after they won the gold medals, held up their fists with black gloves on them. Do you think they were loved by this country? You think they cared and said, you know, we understand why you did it, but we love you anyway? A reporter who was still around today called Brett Musburger, he wrote an article, he called them black-skinned Nazis. When you fight the power, the power will fight back. And they'll say anything possible. You look at what happened to Martin Luther King, or what he went through with civil rights. He fought the power. The power fought back. But today, there's a whitewashing going on. And it's kind of interesting that with the most hated guy today, his name is Colin Kaepernick in sports, they say, we wish he would have did like Martin Luther King did it. We like how King protested. What? Are you kidding me? This is what the enemy does. He has to whitewash some things because they knew they were wrong. Now, at the time, he was hated. Carlos Smith was hated. Ali was hated. And then they all become heroes. So right now, Colin Kaepernick is hated because they feel that, yes, he is doing something against the troops. He's disrespecting the troops. I got news for you. If he did disrespect the troops, he ain't the first one. We have, at any given time, over 40,000 homeless vets in this country. We have 22 vets every day committing suicide. But the guy taking the knee to protest racism and police brutality not all the police, mind you. 
He's the problem. He's disrespecting troops. I wanted to take you back to World War II. Well, World War II, where people that looked like you and me were fighting for this country. In some in bases where they had German troops, the blacks were not allowed to eat with the white troops. But the German prisoner of war were allowed to eat with the American troops. But it's the guy taking the knee is a, a problem. Imagine, imagine, and some of you have some family members who fought in World War II. I had two uncles that fought in World War II. Imagine going to fight for a country and they had to come back to fight again for the same things you just fought for for somebody else. But the guy taking the knee is a problem. There was a story of the Harlem Hellfighters. And this is the funny thing about history. There's a lot of history that I was never taught and I learned later in life. Anyone know who the Harlem Hellfighters were? Okay. They were a name of a black troop. I believe it's called the 575th or 571st. I'm not sure which one. But they were trying to fight for America. And General Pershing at the time says, hey, there'll be no American troops under foreign control, period, except for these black guys. You can have them. Well, these guys fought with bravery and honor and won a bunch of medals. Well, somebody was upset. America was upset. America said, hey, do not give these guys medals because they'll think they're the same and good as us. But the guy taking the knee is a problem. <laughs> Fighting the power will put you out on an island by yourself. But you're not by yourself. Fighting the power will put you in that fiery furnace. But you're not by yourself. When we look at the state of our men who fight in the VA, there's a, a number of different issues of people dying with, with maggots on them, can't get good health care. The guy's taking the need of problem. But you see, when you're fighting something like that, fighting racism, fighting injustice, fighting for equality, it's not easy. It is not easy. And sometimes you fight for yourself. You feel like you're fighting for your, by yourself, but you're not by yourself. Right. When we look at what the women's right had to go through, and that was an interesting story also, because I didn't notice at the time, when they fought for women's suffrage and women's freedom, they were going to march in Washington. So you had black women and white women. The time of the march, the white women told the black women to get in the back. This is America. Now, this, now, we have some issues here. But this guy is not the whole problem. Well, he's, dis he's disrespecting the anthem. Have you ever heard the whole song of the national anthem? The whole song. Not the first verse that we sing, Oh, say, can you see? And the bombs bursting in the air. There's another verse to it, which they don't want to say. So that's homework tonight. Go look it up and take a look at that. But when you're fighting the power, you must be walking with God. You must be walking aside with God. You must let God lead the way. He is your blocker. He is, he is your, he, how do I say, he is your sword to cut through the nonsense. He is one who protects you. You walk with God. So you don't fight the power alone. You fight the power with God. You let God lead the way. You follow. And when you get there, you say, praise God.
Because you go back into Daniel, where Daniel found out what the dream was and how to interpret the dream and what the dream meant. First thing this is praise God. The first thing this is praise God. That's what we have to do. You think when they went to these cases in front of the Supreme Court and other courts on Brown versus Board of Education, you don't think they prayed? Oh, they were praying. Oh, they were praying like no tomorrow. When you're in class, when you're in school, you need to be praying before every class. It does not have to be a long, drawn-out prayer for 20 seconds. It could be three seconds. Lord, help me. Lord, protect me. Lord, guide me. And when you're done, Lord, thank you. Those are not long prayers. And anyone can do them. Because they say they don't want to take prayer out of schools. You can't. As long as you have tests, you're going to have prayer in school. Lord, help me. So when you fight the power, you call upon the Lord. He fights the battles, not you. He wins the wars, not you. He gets the praise, not you. You don't praise yourself. You praise our Lord and risen Savior. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Let us stand as we open the doors of the church. And if you're a father church home, I invite you now to come forward. The doors of the church are open. As our praise team comes to sing, when you fight the power, you need someone on your side so you can win the battle. Now you can pull some people on your side and you may win, you may lose. You pull Jesus on your side, you're not going to lose, you're going to win. You win with Christ. Everyone else is 50-50 if that, if that good. Walk with Christ. Walk with one who can lead you. Walk with one who can guide you. Walk with one who can protect you. Walk with one who loves you. But the doors of the church are open. And if you're part of the church, I'm inviting you now to come forward. The invitation is set for you. If you're looking for a church home, there's a home here at Cedar Grove United Methodist Church.
Please turn to page 12 in your hymnal as our communion stewards come forward. That's page 12. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let's confess our sin before God and one another. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God loves toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The great thanksgiving, page 13. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so will your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave the disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Forever. And amen. On that night, he took the bread and he broke it. This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. Hands of the cross. Hands of the cross. Hands of the cross. Amen. So this is my book, which is poured out for you. table has been set. The ushers will give you directions. The table is open for all. You may come.
Lord, give us the strength to fight the power, Lord. We know, Lord, we fight the power. We don't fight it alone. We fight it with you. Thank you, Lord, for being there for us. Amen. Amen. May rise and go in peace. Savior, which is poured out for you. Take and drink. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we sat at your table once again, Lord, you have strengthened us and renewed us, Lord. So, Lord, we fight the power of the Lord. We are not fighting alone. We are fighting with the power of Jesus Christ. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. May rise and go in peace.